With the fires raging on the east coast of Australia, we're going to discuss more in depth about preparations and how to survive a bushfire and what you need to think about. So by now you've already created a plan. So in the winter you've decided with your family to prepare your home, prepare yourself, discussing with the family what to do. Now comes the time where you've got the situation of a fire not far from where you are. Now you've got the warnings coming out on TV and radio. And what should you do? Okay, first of all, let's look at some of the ratings in New South Wales when it comes to the fire danger ratings. The catastrophic level is the highest that it can go, and it's very rare for that to be announced. Now, in times of catastrophic fire danger ratings, the only option is to leave and to leave early. Leave bushfire-prone areas the night before or early in the day. You don't want to stay around and see what happens. Make a plan to go somewhere where it is still safe as well. And make a decision of when you'll leave, where you'll go, and how you'll get there, and when you will return. Extreme, severe, very high. Still has high risks about staying and defending your house. But one of the the key things in the preparation is if you are going to make that decision to leave, leave early and don't leave at the last minute. Now what can happen and has happened in previous fires An example is the South Australian fires a few years ago where about 30 people lost their lives getting into a car accident on the roads and ended up either the fire overrunning them. The crazy thing was that most of their homes actually survived the fire. So if those people had stayed there, they would have lived. Now imagine you've left too late, you go down your street, your road, your highway Even a highway can get blocked. You've got lots of people trying to just do their daily commute. You've got firefighters trying to get to the scene of the fire. Police, ambulance, emergency services. Small streets get clogged, hoses everywhere. It's just complete chaos. So leaving early is one of the the best options, especially if your home is not prepared and you haven't been able to prepare that home to be able to defend it. Now, you probably have gone through with your family in terms of staying and defending your home. You might say, okay, some members of the family aren't up to staying at home, so those members will leave early. And then that decision of the people that stay have to really follow through with some uh, basic steps, I guess you could call it. Sometimes not basic to some people, but what you do really need to think about is a whole list of things because in terms of a fire, things are just chaotic. They're just not normal and things can get out of hand. One of the most important things if you're going to stay is your protective clothing. Now, you've probably seen firefighters wearing quite heavy protective clothing, gloves, helmets, strong boots, and you might think that's really hot and heavy to wear in a hot situation. Well, it is. But if you don't go with the same principles that a firefighter is wearing, you could end up badly injured, and that's the reason that those clothes are designed for fighting fires. So we don't have the same outfits as a firefighter, but what can we do? Well, with protective clothing, you can wear a wide-brimmed hat. If you have a helmet, even better, because... You don't want falling branches to to land on your head and hopefully you haven't got any falling branches because any branches are well enough away from your property. Eye protection goggles just helps you to be able to see because with smoke it can really sting your eyes. So having some kind of goggles can help. A face mask or a a moist cloth. You might see some firefighters with uh, large cloths or or clean nappies wet around their, their mouths and that's so they can breathe and also to provide a bit of relief around the neck as well. The other thing you don't want to happen is to have embers coming down the back of your shirt and you might see the firefighting helmets with a little bit of a a flap around the back and that's to prevent embers from uh, entering the back of the firefighter's necks. Just simply a long sleeve cotton shirt and it needs to be cotton that you're wearing 
or uh, a non-flammable material. If you've got any polyester, you don't actually have to have it burn you, but even the radiant heat can melt underpants or underclothes or anything that's connected to the skin. So you need to have material that is at least somewhat flam- uh, inflammable, like cotton. Uh, long pants. You see a lot of people with uh, shorts trying to hose their houses down. It's not necessarily just the fire. It's actually the radiant heat, and that can actually burn you without even touching you. And you can have the, the radiant heat a couple of hundred metres away, and it will still burn you if the intensity of the uh, the fire is, is strong enough. So long pants, long cotton pants or jeans, and also sturdy boots. And one of the things also to, to look out for, you might have a set of sturdy boots, but just make sure that they're not steel cap and is the steel cap can heat up from the radiant heat as well. That's more if you're going to be intensively out in the ash or the fire itself. One of the most overlooked pieces of protective equipment is gloves and people think oh yeah I can do without some gloves but it's quite essential to use gloves. Uh, We as firefighters use gloves and I know people who have uh, resisted using gloves and then they've just done a simple act like rolling up a hose and the hose has caught some glass and then that glass has ripped their hands apart. So that's that's a, a lesson that even people who uh, don't normally fight fires can can adhere to as well. If you are inside a house and then you you go outside after the fire's gone through, you might just touch the door handle and it the radiant heat could still be left in the door handle and burn your hand just simply by touching the door or the door handle. Uh, when you go outside and turn the tap on, the tap could be extremely hot as well so that could burn you as well so gloves are uh, certainly one of those those things that you really do need to think about garden gloves that are leather are perfect they're uh, a bit of an insulator for fire and for radiant heat which is what it's all about now to some of the equipment that you might have and you might have a tank a water tank at home the recommendation is to have at least around about 10,000 litres of water whether that be a tank, a dam, a pool. And if you've got a generator, a petrol or diesel generator is preferred because if you do have an electric generator, the power could go out. The power could go out from simply the fire and what happens uh, these days is sometimes the electricity supply authorities will actually turn the power off to prevent further strikes of the uh, the wires onto the ground so don't rely on a an electric powered generator a petrol or diesel power generator is preferable and even if you have an electric pump you might be able to attach a simple diesel or petrol generator to it and that also could be a solution if you're staying and defending your house uh, some of the things to think about is to have some buckets and mops around. You don't always have to put water on fire. Have some other sources of water, like a bathtub or a sink, full of water if you can before a fire. One of the best tips as well is, if you're staying and defending your home, is to think about your hose. You need a hose that should reach around the entire property. But also, if that hose is caught out in the fire, in the heat, it is going to melt. Also, the connectors are going to melt. So if, for instance, you've taken your, your hose inside the house, which is recommended, while you, uh, you, you, you are expecting a, a fire front to come over your house, and if you haven't taken that connector off the tap, the tap connector could melt, and then when you go to try and connect your hose to that tap, there's no way you can do it because it's just a, a, a plastic glob on the end of your tap. So take the connectors inside as well. Even if you have, say, a brass connector, there's a little rubber O-ring and that rubber O-ring can uh, melt as well and then not make a a clean connection to your hose. Also, not just your hose, but any firefighting equipment, if you can take it inside so it won't burn during a Passover of a fire. You have to think of the fine details of what you're going to do when you defend your home. One of the worst things that I do see people do is standing on their roof, certainly with no protective clothing, and standing on your roof is one of the most dangerous things you can do 
They think that uh, standing on the roof they can see a bit better, but it is so dangerous. That is one of the most dangerous things. Your home is easily defendable once a fire has gone through. It's burnt through most of the fuel on the ground. And then what can happen sometimes is just a little bit of a fire on a gutter can then turn into a big fire and eventually, after five or ten minutes, can actually burn the whole house down. Houses don't generally just explode. They generally start off as a little fire. And if that fire can be put out at an early stage, and that's the whole point of staying and defending your home, is by literally patrolling every part of your home once that fire front has gone through. One of the other things, if uh, you, you are going to shelter inside your home, make sure that you've got an exit for where that shelter is. Don't, make, don't go to somewhere down the back of your house. Shelter in a room on the opposite side of the house from the approaching fire and ensure you have clear access to an exit that's a long way from a door that you can exit the, the house. That's, that's quite a dangerous situation if you do happen to get stuck inside your house. A simple thing that people also forget is the front doormat. Now, most people have straw front doormats, and that is completely flammable. It can catch on fire if a a fire front is passing through, and it will then set your door alight. Actually, one of the things you should do is get rid of that front doormat, bring it inside, or put it way away from the house, but just don't leave your front straw doormat right at the front door there, because that also can be a potential source of fuel for a fire. Now, if you've got a fire front approaching, some of the things that you can do before the fire approaches, turn off the gas mains or the bottle, move any last-minute flammable items away from the house, block drain pipes with socks filled with sand, or you can get from hardware stores some of those plugs. They're a little bit harder to find these days, but a simple sock filled with sand can do the same job. Patrol your house well before the fire arrives and put out any embers or spot fires. Now, it has been the case in previous fires where people have gone to go and sticky beak at a fire. Their houses are a couple of streets away from where the actual fire is. And what's happened is the fire embers have travelled over their heads and over to where their house is and have burnt their house down while they're standing around thinking that their house is all safe. So after the fire is passed, you need to check inside and outside the house. Check the cavities of your roof, under the deck, under the stairs, under the window sills, and keep checking for the next few hours just in case small fires or burning embers do approach any of those small spaces or cavities. So when thinking about whether you're going to stay and defend your house, You need to think about whether you're prepared mentally and physically. And certainly if other members of your household aren't up to that stage, you might need to think about evacuating them well in advance of any fire front. If flames are on top of you, the heat can become unbearable and move inside until the fire front has passed. And that can be anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, all depending on the intensity of the fire. There are some really good tips on the New South Wales RFS website, rfs.newsouthwales.gov.au, and that can be very handy in finding out some extra tips, including neighbourhood safer places, and that's one place you can go to to find out where you can go in the time of a fire. And remember, sometimes the place to go to to shelter could be in the opposite direction because the fire could be coming from the direction that you might have had in your mind where that safe neighbourhood place is. Again, know your risk. Know about the area that you live in. If you're in, say, the Blue Mountains, that's one of the most fire-prone areas in the world. So you have to know the surrounds. Know that a fire is going to run twice as fast up a hill than it is going to be on a flat surface. Okay, say you live in dense bushland. Well, that's going to be one of the most dangerous things. If you haven't got a fire break around your property and you haven't prepared it well in advance, well, then your chances of survival are going to be slim and you need to think about going early. If you live in grasslands, well, grasslands, a fire can rapidly spread through grass, cured grass, and be on top of you well before you know it. And it can reach up to speeds of 60 kilometres an hour. You can't outrun a bushfire on a grassland if 
there's a strong enough wind behind it. You might think living near the coast is quite fire safe, but some of the vegetation on coastal cliff tops is actually quite flammable. So don't think that just living near the coast is going to save you as well. Burning embers may be blown from other areas and start spot fires right near where you are. So a couple of things to learn about fire behaviour is know the type of area you are in. A slope of more than 10 degrees doubles the speed of the fire. So living on the top of a hill that might have a great aspect is fantastic for the view, but actually could be more dangerous. What type of vegetation is around? Have you got fine fuels? Have you got a lot of leaf litter that's been building up over a long period of time? That can be a problem if your area hasn't been prescribed burned or or hazard reduced over a long period of time. What's the weather like? Is it hot? Is it dry? Is it humid? Is it really windy? Where's the wind direction coming from? There are a lot of factors that you have to think of. So with all those plans in place, where can I go? Well, ABC Radio in Australia has bushfire information and that's updated every time it needs to be done where you are. Make sure your mobile phone is charged. If you're in a a phone notification area, you'll get a notification on your phone whether it's too late to leave and you need to seek shelter. And also the RFS website is pretty good for information. Good information in the wintertime in preparation and good information about what you can do. I hope this podcast has helped a little bit in your preparation for what you and your family might do in terms of a fire. But the key to any of this is preparation. So let's talk about fire itself. What is fire and how can it be contained? You might think bringing a big air tanker in with massive amounts of water is going to save everything and save the day. Well, in actual fact, sometimes just a cup of water on a small fire can actually put out what could intensively burn a whole house down. And things like a steel rake or a hoe can put some dirt on a fire and smother it. So you don't always need massive amounts of water. So the three elements that make up a fire is heat, fuel and oxygen. There also is another one called either chain reaction or chemical, but that's more a different type of fire. We're talking primarily about bushfires. Think of it in those three terms, heat, oxygen and fuel. If you take any one of those factors away, you'll actually put out the fire and that's the easiest thing to do. So when you're putting water onto a fire, you're cooling it, but also just as that blanket of water is heading over the top of the fire, you're actually starving it of oxygen. The fuel will still be there, it'll be wet And depending on what sort of conditions you you have, if that water has evaporated before it's got to the actual fire, the fuel could still be there, the oxygen might still be there, and the heat could still be there. And putting a bit of water on actually might not make any difference at all. When you put a bit of dirt over the top of, of the fire, it has a very similar action to using water. It can actually reduce the heat. It can starve the fire of oxygen, it can cover the the fuel. One of the things that uh, we as firefighters do in the winter time is actually try and reduce the the other part, which is the fuel loads. And that can be done as prescribed burning, where you do a little checkerboard of just burning sections. And that can also be helpful for wildlife to escape into the unburnt section. And hazard reduction, which is a bit more of a blanket area, but we still do leave little patches for wildlife to escape to. Hazard reduction prescribed burning is really essential to what we need to do in this community. So those basic elements of the fire, removing the oxygen, removing the heat, removing the fuel, any one of those will actually calm and put out a fire. So the most important thing is to know your risk, prepare your home, prepare your family, know what the danger is specific to your area, know your land where you live. The key to the whole message is to plan and prepare, and preparing will save your life. I hope this information has been helpful, and as a supplement to other information that you can get, it's going to be a long, hot summer in New South Wales and the wider Australia, so there's still plenty of time to get in and prepare yourself and prepare your family, but just make sure that you do stay safe. Thanks very much for joining us and I hope you can join us on our next podcast.